So here we are for our final session of this fantastic seminar. And um, the session is called Health Technologies and the Humanization of Care. And we'll have presentations from Simone Diniz from the University of Sao Paulo. She's a professor uh, in the School of Public Health, specializing in maternal and child health. And then we will hear from our own Amy Moran Thomas. Welcome back. Um, she's a postdoc at Brown and almost ready to start her work at MIT in the Department of Anthropology there. So it's a great pleasure to have Simone and Amy. And then uh, José Ricardo and I will present some impressions, questions, make comments, try to stitch a thing, few things together, separate a few other things, try to make sense if we can. And, um, and, um, and then you know, they will respond, and then we'll hear from you guys. And the idea of a final discussion here is really to draw together these various threads that we, that we, that we touched, opened up for discussion, and, um, and uh, in the spirit of continuing this as an open-ended journey. So we'll first hear from uh, Simone. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a huge honor for me to be here, a great pleasure. And I have to tell you that I've learned so much today that I kept changing my presentation several times <laughs> to interact with what was said. So I, I think, I hope we can still understand the, some of the main messages because it's a huge challenge to talk about health technology and humanization of care. <coughs> and I'll try to bring some of the insights and reflections about the, the movement for humanization of childbirth care in Brazil and uh, what it can contribute to this debate. So first of all, I will discuss a bit about health technology and about the evidence-based healthcare movement and the specificities of the, this movement in childbirth care, the issue of safety and the heterogeneities in healthcare, and uh, healthcare in intervention as violence that is the new uh, challenge that we are facing, the reason why people are calling what we call care as violence. And also uh, to bring to you a bit on these insights on humanization, what it means in Brazil, especially uh, in the movement about childbirth, the many meanings, uh, and what we can uh, learn for listening from these many meanings, the social movement, especially feminist and women's rights movement, and the, the three public audience that we are having this semester, the first one was in August, uh, the second one in, in, in October, and now uh, next Monday we're gonna have the third one. And I'll tell you how social movements are helping to frame the debate about healthcare. So first I would say that um, humanization in childbirth has many different meanings. And uh, in my uh, PhD thesis I have I made a mapping of these different meanings. And um, I'll tell you first that the, the foundation of the, uh, the network for humanization of childbirth, the Reuna, that was uh, in 1993, it was very much inspired by the post Vienna Human Rights Conference and uh, very much related to the debate in Brazil about violence in healthcare. So it was one of the meeting, meanings of humanization was very strongly related with the compassionate and rights-oriented healthcare, but also in the case of childbirth, very much related to the idea of evidence-based care that descends from the idea of appropriate technology of the 80s. Uh, very strongly the idea of demedicalization, not medical-centered, involving other providers such as nurse, nurse midwives and midwives, uh, for, especially for doctors, it was related to the idea of the use of pain relief and the right to epidural, mainly doctors, when you ask about what is humanization for them, frequently that was their meaning. And uh, there was a whole debate about the financial legitimacy of other source, other, other forms of childbirth care. And uh, from the debate that was uh, uh, developed within this field and uh, other inspirations, the, the Unified Health Service in Brazil, the SUIS, uh, incorporated the idea and had a whole program on humanization of healthcare that started in 2000. Uh, bringing other dimensions about humanization with uh, adding new meanings. So uh, let me tell you that in recent years, we have a very vocal social movement for changing childbirth. 
So this movement has been uh, proposing new forms of uh, uh, care and uh, is helping very much to free everything from the, the, the judicial system to the research agenda to um, the, the information <coughs> system and so on. It has is having a very important influence on, on training programs and so on. Uh, let me say that left this based care in childbirth is a very particular case and that maybe does not apply to all other forms of health care. First, because because of its history, it's very much woman-centered, consumer-oriented, and the idea of the consumer here is the idea that the NHS in UK has, that's health, public health system user, not necessarily the idea of the market. So this is a, a controversial uh, term, um, especially because of their participation in the, in the building of the, the whole concept of a systematic review and uh, patient-oriented systematic reviews, that, which is very important role in this movement. Uh, the, in this case, evidence-based care is very political and subversive of regular practices, which tend to be very aggressive. In the case of Brazil, they are very aggressive. We were listening to uh, the, 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 the case of the kangaroo care that I think is very much related to this. Deals with the normal, the physiology, which is different from in the case that you have a illness, a serial illness, a fatal illness. It, it's very much related to the idea of the communication, the idea of birth plans, and so on. And the gold standard of care is having a woman, baby, and family well and happy with minimal intervention compatible with safety and comfort, which is a very dense and complex uh, concept. And also, it's very, uh, let's say, not very profitable because respectful surveillance with no intervention is not uh, <coughs> a, a good, as people used to say, a, new, a good mo uh, model to make money because uh, it incorporates knowledge, attention, time, patience, presence, support, and can involve this investment in technology. So innovation in maternal health can mean not only incorporate new technology, but disincorporate technology. Kangaroo care is also a good example of this. So one question brought by this movement is, any, is any healthcare safe and effective? And we tend to believe that no. Safe, effective interventions tend to produce positive outcomes. So expanding access to them tends to be beneficial, but the use of inappropriate, unsafe technology tends to produce adverse outcomes that may outweigh potential benefits of social disparities and of beneficial intervention. That's what we call inversion of expected disparity. For instance, in Brazil we have more babies born preterm of the wealthier mothers, most educated than the poorer one. Not because being poor or not educated is good for anyone's health, but because care can, uh, harmful care can outweigh potential benefits of the, the, um, the social advantage. <coughs> so in Brazil, we suffer and die for, we have the worst of the two words. We suffer and die for lack of safe and effective intervention, and we suffer and die for the abuse of ineffective, unsafe interventions. So uh, can we uh, consider that care is equal to treatment or to interventions? Uh, I, I brought here, uh, we, ha we are with the students, we, we have an undergraduate course in Sao Paulo, University of Sao Paulo for public health. It's a new course, we have just started it two years ago. And we have a, a program, a module called evidence-based, evidence, the evidence base for public health. So we try to debate the epistemology of knowledge that could be applied for public health. And we were uh, revisiting this author, uh, Art Archie Cochrane. And there's, a, there's this scene about the soldier that we were discussing these days that I, I, I like to bring it to you. He's, he was a... Uh, a prisoner of war, in the hospital of prisoner of war, and uh, he says, I had no morphia. I was talking about the, 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 the wonderful conference on pain today. I have no morphia, just aspirin, which had no <laughs> effect. I felt desperate. I know this was a, a young Ru Russian soldier that got to, the, to his ward. I knew very little Russian, and there was nobody in the ward who did. I finally, instinctively, sat down on the bed and took him in my arms, and this screaming stopped almost at once. 
He died peacefully in my arms a few hours later. Later, it was not the pleurisy that was causing the screaming, but loneliness. He tells this and he says, I kept this to myself for 30 years because I was not able to talk about uh, how effective he felt that that kind of intervention was. So he talks about how to overcome the silence and talk about these dimensions of care. The issue, I was thinking about the issue of physical intimacy too. And uh, this is, I'm not proposing, and he was not proposing that this kind of care is incorporated, but it puts a very radical dim dimension in terms of what care could be. And he, he brings this to discuss the inflation of cure over care and who benefits of this. And he says, I believe that cure is rare, why the need for care is widespread, and that the pursuit of cure at all costs it may restrict the supply of care. So when you think about care, he asks, is it possible to teach compassion and kindness, especially for, the, for health providers in training? Uh, and this, this is very interesting because we were in the situation, especially uh, recently, the issue of understaffed services and how this is a threat to compassion. How could be people be compassionate when they are overburdened and with fatigue? So I'm bringing this to talk about also uh, what we think about safety in healthcare. And I bring to you um, an editorial of our uh, obstetric and gynecologist journal that the, the editorialist says, there is no doubt that even if it contains unnecessary or even greater risk for the mother and the newborn, cesarean section has a much lower risk for the obstetrician, he says. So the idea, when you think about care, it's whose safety is privileged and how can we put in, the, in the, uh, this context the conflict of interest. There are not only financial, and how do we deal with the risk of demonizing providers and women, in the case of Brazil, the women, how not to demonize providers and women who prefer C-section? Because uh, social movements are saying, uh, C-section in Brazil is a strategy to escape from violent childbirth care. Uh, so safety is a political agenda this movement is, is bringing. And recently, because in Brazil we have <coughs> a very fundamentalistic, um, Congress presently and got worse, you know, with the new elections. This government has been kidnapped by uh, um, Christian fundamentalists. We cannot talk about abortions, for instance. And recently, just the movement for childbirth care is dealing with abortion and bringing the issue of safe technology for abortion. That's a huge, important debate. Uh, so I'll try tell you how these movements are influencing the, uh, the agenda. So we, uh, I was trying to, to get the best translation for the Ministerio Publico, but I think it is public prosecutor, at least according to several inf informants. <laughs> so uh, in Brazil, we have the, pub the Ministerio Publico, the public prosecutor that uh, takes care of the state to make sure that the state is doing their obligations. Uh, this one is the, the, the part of this that deals with health. So social movements, uh, especially the network called Parto Principio, they feel, feel uh, a suit in court to the public health prosecutor in 2006 against the agency that was supposed to regulate the private sector, but does not, against the abuse of C-section. So the, the, the Ministerio Publico judged this action and mandated all involved to witness about this issue. So this is a very interesting situation, but the judge puts everybody, and uh, the medical association, the medical council, the, the nursing, the schools, etc., and the women who feel that they are victims of this kind of care. And uh, one of the most important recommendations was the issue of accountability. So presently, we are having, I'm gonna show you, uh, should be in the better order, um, sorry. We are having a public consultation about C-section. And there are the two main uh, requests for these consultations is that hospital now have to 
publicize all the rates of intervention, including C-sections, uh, episiotomies, inductions, how many babies are born preterm, and so on. It's an issue of labeling. Uh, people are calling this also, they are recovering a strategy that uh, social movements did in the 80s in UK that they call uh, the, the Michelin Guide for Services. It's, uh, it's, uh, if the state does not regulate the, the consumers, the users, the patients will do this themselves. So uh, now with the internet, it's much easier to do. They, they, it's a kind of triple device, I think. So they demand that the state does this presently too. So one of the most important change that we had in recent years was that uh, the, there was an international movement to consider uh, violence in healthcare institutions as a visible form of gender violence. So there's a, a lot of recent um, social movements internationally, and this, I'm bringing you one of this chart. This is the white ribbon analyzed chart that brings the forms of violence. This is very interesting because when we were in the 90s, there was a whole debate if we would call the name of our movement a movement against violence against women, or we talk about humanization. And we thought that humanization would be much more diplomatic than talking about violence. And now this, this is back again with, with a lot of strange, but uh, this one of the most important and revolutionary issues that are being put by this chart that challenge our training as providers, especially ourselves as doctors, is the idea that non-consented care is a form of violence. This is absolutely new, you know? So redescribing non-consented care as violence, you know, or how people are saying internationally not obstetric violence, but disrespect and abusive facility-based childbirth is a widespread discourse. Now, even the WHO has a campaign that was launched one and a half months ago, a very interesting one, making people to understand that what's the reason why, for instance, so many populations refuse to go to service because they feel so poorly treated, they feel disrespected. So, uh, so this made visible and even contribute to create a lot of indicators related to violence in health institutions. This is not a, a problem just for childbirth, of course, but childbirth is a moment of this uh, this cultural misogyny is concentrated, and of course, this violence is not equally distributed. There are several studies in Brazil and everywhere the women who are in the bottom of the social hierarchy, the, those who are in Brazil, those who are not uh, uh, the, the black, the, the with less, uh, the, uh, all the markers of difference, you know, they are much more vulnerable to violence. Uh, and also, the, uh, one other issue that's politicizing care is the idea uh, of uh, how people get the new biomedical narratives and appropriate these narratives uh, in a political way. One of the, the issues are the new uh, insights of epigenetics and microbiology. All, everybody in the social movements are reading these reviews because now there is an explanation about what the, what's the reason why the offspring, the, the people who are born by C-section have a different metabolic and uh, immunological characteristics if you compare them. And so they have more obesity, uh, they have more diabetes, they have more asthma, they have more uh, uh, allergy in general, they have a more inflammatory metabolism. So there are a lot of new research on this. So uh, uh, social movements are incorporating this to challenge care and to demand in court, like they are doing now, that women have right to be informed about this. Because in our culture we say, oh, if the mother is well and the baby is well, what's, what's the problem of having C-section? So as feminists, we defend that women should have the right to deliver the way they want. They have the whole authority to decide but the information should be the most honest possible. So I will show you the use of technology for, a, for <coughs> low risk birth, what people call humanized cesarean section. So you have an elective cesarean section. Uh, it has to be elective because it's a party. You know, you have to contract a buffet, you know, and uh, you, you, you put all the family here for this as a kind of show. 
and we have it, it's a celebration you know it so it's very interesting how uh, in these uh, choices of kind of care we uh, incorporate values and we reinforce values uh, it, and this is very interesting there are several theses about this this kind of uh, um, let's say use of technology for healthcare you know this, if I compare this use of technology with uh, this use of technology because we say <coughs> that unregulated universalization of healthcare is what people say that pessimization of childbirth pessimization of the experience so social movements are saying that the worst possible ex experience is made for women to escape from this and how can they escape from this uh, the recent uh, survey, the Bo Bo Birth in Brazil survey, shows that uh, if you go through labor, you increase very much your chance of reporting violence. So not going through labor is uh, the most important strategy uh, to escape from this, you know? Uh, it, the other thing that was very much, is, this is very much important when you think about care is that the harms of unsafe intervention are attributed to vaginal birth. The, the, and that the physiological pain and diatrogenic pain are different. So we, in the kind of care, can add pain, can add suffering, they are unnecessary. They are not the physiological one. Um, and t today I was listening to Keith's <coughs> wonderful presentation and thinking about what social movement is saying about the, their indignity in pain, especially remember our uh, the myth of foundation is that uh, you is reenacted when people say why are you screaming you want to have s you had sex you liked it so why are you complaining why are you crying this is a, a, a very much repeated to demoralize women's demand for for help or for pain relief etc but social movement i say they want the physical sensation of childbirth and that is glory on this pain so they, they also, this, uh, they say, one woman, she, she's a runner, she say, the physical discomfort of running is extreme, you know? Can be extreme, you know? If when you are the end of a marathon, for instance, <laughs> but we call this glory, isn't it? It's glorious to, to feel that discomfort, but this is considered an indignity. So what's the reason why we rate pain so differently? Why the, the cultural, dimensions of this. So um, this is something also that we should pay attention to. And also that physical and emotional abuse uh, and perinatal outcomes are not visible. We need new indicators for this situation. Uh, and so we have this new movement. That's a movement for, based on the idea that unconsented care is a form of violence, the idea of refusal of care. There are several campaigns, you know, about uh, refusal of care, informed refusal. Uh, there is this public <coughs> consultation with the, the Michelin guides. Uh, I will tell you about this. I'll try to, to finish. Uh, the, the, the other public audience is about episiotomy. As you know, episiotomy is the cutting of women's vulva and vagina uh, based on belief that facilitate birth and to, to keep women's vagi vagina virginal. It's called the, the, the husband stitch. There are 30 <coughs> years, 20 years of good evidence. Most of the, the countries, some of them have decreased dramatically. The use in Brazil, we don't have uh, routine information still. There's a whole campaign just to have information in the data source and information system about this because there's a, a enormous resistance for that. Um, and I bring you one narrative that shocked everybody in the last, uh, the, in this public audience that uh, was a woman, I think it was not, uh, she was black, and she delivered, I think very recently because she was the baby on her lap. And uh, in our hospital school, the, the Agau, and she said she, she heard that the, the, the professor saying, the, the, uh, she, she, he gave one scissor to one and the other scissor to what and said, you cut on the right, you cut on the left. That's what people, the training vagina, you have the training hospital, you have the training health center, this is the training vagina. Women, uh, women's vagina is used for, for uh, uh, medical students to train their uh, 
surgical uh, abilities. Uh, um, this is not an adapter. This was something that was said in justice, you know, uh, and the uh, Agau, the, the hospital, is having to respond to this because this is part of the, the, the culture. And when we do this, what kind of values are we teaching? We are calling this care. We call this health care, you know, cutting women's vagina unnecessarily for training purposes. Without women have the choice of refusing. So there's a whole movement of women refusing to have episiotomies and how they were physically contained and had this episiotomy regardless of their written refusal. Um, so health innovation can include both withdrawal, disinvestment of technology. So there is a, I, I would say about the, the, the social movements initiatives regarding this kind of uh, assistance. This is a, uh, a move, one of the movements had this, this poster they put in several places in hospitals and like, like a direct action kind of uh, uh, approach. Uh, and we have just the last one is the one that's gonna be Monday on the obstetric violence. So there's several other, other uh, actions, cultural action, films and, and photograph uh, exhibits and so on. Um, and um, to finish, uh, I would say that one of the most important things that this movement brings is the idea that we are ignorant in terms of the safety and effectivity of care and we have to improve our literacy in terms of this. Yes, there are poor settings that literacy rates are low, even for people who cannot read or write, you know, uh, in general, not about relative risk reduction or things like this. Uh, but let's start, with, with the, the vast majority has, and the people were saying that uh, social movements are very much working to improve health literacy for both patients and providers, because there are several studies showing that providers cannot distinguish about between relative risk and absolute risk. You know, they, they don't have the, 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 the minimal literacy to, to understand uh, scientific literature. So uh, especially after, uh, if, and it could be made much more simple. So the core of, of evidence-based movements are patient rights, informed consent, choice and refusal. I'm, considering the, the, the start of my presentation, we have to reclaim the authority to decide about their own body and health, and for that we need to overcome ignorance, passivity, and violence in healthcare. So this, uh, this is a, another movement, it's about a woman, uh, this is the, the, the core of the public audience, it's uh, about a woman who was arrested by eight armed soldiers last April to have a C-section that she refused because she had a previous C-section, she was arrested, you know, and left made to the hospital. There were demonstrations all around Brazil. And this is a demonstration of how, this is the case that people are lobbying about, it's about how to understand risk. This is about uh, a case that I do like, and maybe some of you here have been involved with this. It's about uh, prostate cancer early detection and screening, you know? So this is a way to explain, for instance, that you have 1,000 men being screened and not screening. Now, you know, the number of people who die is the same. The number of people who die of prostate cancer is the same. But look at the amount of men who are harmed by the intervention itself. These used to be invisible, you know? We do not deal with the issue of potential harm of iatrogenesis. So we have to translate this to patients. Uh, we can use technology to intervene and to not intervene. You know, you have to, you can't promote uh, uh, physiology with technology. Technology is not just for promoting this and finish the way forward. It's how to involve people, patients, consumers, users, whatever you want to call them in the design of evaluation of healthcare interventions technology and experiences, because the issue of experience is key to here. Uh, the scientific literacy, how to deal with this for user and for providers, how to advance this, we need a lot of imagination, even to redefine healthcare needs, what are our needs, not needs that are defined by providers, and the, and the, 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 the pharmaceutical industry or the, the equipment industry, 
how to promote informed choice, consent refusal in healthcare. Now that we have this phenomenon that is the a, a, a expert, expert patient, even in poor settings, there's a lot of studies about the expert patient in poor settings, nobody knows better for you about your symptoms you have than yourself. So how to, to match this with uh, the best scientific knowledge and how to deal with equity in access and quality, but also with the inversion of expected disparities and how can providers and other, other than doctors be involved in healthcare. Thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to talk um, about this Vonnegut quote um, that everybody wants to build and nobody wants to do maintenance uh, in relation to a sort of a certain set of global health practices that I saw. Um, but let me start by thanking two people who are total counter examples um, to that formulation. Uh, Joao and Jose Ricardo, you know, the program that this uh, form grows out of, it requires so much maintenance and is part of this sustained conversation around global health. So thank you for um, the invitation to be here. Okay. As Ethan opened a padlock and led me inside the hospital's garage, it felt like we were stepping into an abandoned museum of medicine. The cavernous room, with a tin roof set aloft by wooden rafters, was crowded with aging machines that were once used to restart American patients' hearts or wash their blood. Some of the devices were coated in sawdust and trailed electric cords and tubing, with piles of lumber and paintbrushes tucked around between them. Others were wrapped in mummy-type bundles, layers of cellophane, revealing only the vague contours of an engineered anatomy beneath. People just keep bringing them down here, mostly our American volunteers, Ethan told me explaining that most of the analog machines arrived to Belize in boxcar-sized box containers carried across the ocean. I feel bad because they pay a lot for shipping, he, sa he added. They really think that we're going to be able to use them somehow, even the old dialyzers with no cartridges and pieces missing. Ethan was quite sympathetic to the caring sentiments that motivated the volunteers' donations. If somewhat perplexed with his role curating these fossils of good intentions. Yet he also seemed unwilling to throw the broken machines away, searching fondly amid the hod hodgepodge for his favorite specimens with archaic knobs and antique dials to show me. We also encountered some recently opened cardboard boxes, and Ethan explained that several years ago, an NGO had sent these tiles for building a building project that had not included the specialized foreign laminate needed to install them. But a maintenance man at the hospital had just figured out a method to soak the tiles in a bathtub and loosen the adhesive on their backs, which then could be scraped clean one by one uh, and installed even without the missing laminate. The workers were using these painstakingly modified tiles to build what, as we spoke in the summer of 2010, um, everyone hoped would become the region's first dialysis center. This unsettling scene in the hospital garage stuck with me particularly because the house artifacts seem to emblematize, and even caricature, flip sides of intervention practices that pattern out more widely across chronic conditions and beliefs. Mission volunteers like the ones that Ethan spoke about were a regular part of the stream of transient <coughs> visitors rotating through the country's landscape. There were church groups, high school groups, university medical students on spring break. At the time, I was tracking the diabetes epidemic that had become the leading cause of death in Belize, part of a larger global epidemic of diabetes, um, which the International Diabetes Federation now estimates kills 5 million people a year. Um, so that's more than double uh, the mortality burden of HIV AIDS, for example. Um, and three-fourths of them are thought to live in post-colonial countries. In Belize, these mission teams played a prominent role in how people thought about their conditions and encountered the piecemeal technologies to treat them. The aging dialysis machines and other medical apparatuses in the garage were only the largest of these artifacts, which were also visible on a smaller scale in many homes and kitchens. Envelopes of expiring metformin and glybride anti-diabetes pills labeled in visiting hands. Or the foreign glucometers that often sat unused on shelves for years after they were donated by a visiting team because the expensive and brand-specific replacement strips necessary to make them function were very difficult for people to actually acquire with any consistency. So there's a lot that could be debated about the forces and visions that drive this kind of tourism 
called medicine. Um, and it's perhaps one of the most concerningly ephemeral dimensions of the field we've come to call global health. So you see here uh, how the medical help for the sick is offered um, as part of a package that includes things like snorkeling or scuba diving. Uh, certainly these programs have complicated effects. <coughs> so um, just to give you a sense of the landscape here, often there are poor communities that are um, you know, adjacent to these tourist sites um, that uh, the sort of poorest communities are called London Bridges communities because they're connected by um, these <coughs> platforms that are always falling down and have to be built back up. Um, so there's, again, this deep tension in uh, what care means here. Um, and students who are on these trips are trying, I think, to care um, in some way. But they're also very much a part of a fragmentation in care for the people um, who live in these places. So I encountered these previous in interventions most often through the technologies of counting that they left behind, as patients took up the task of trying to get them working again, such as the first visit to the pharmacy when a patient realized that a new jar of strips would cost between 80 and and $100 uh, for about one month's supply to keep a glucometer working, and still might not be available even if that sizable amount could somehow be saved or borrowed. Um, so like statistics, the measurements of glucometers were sort of part of how people came in and out of numbers, and to me how that became sort of ethnographically visible uh, somehow. Each machine can use only the strips specifically designed not just for the brand but for the model, meaning you had to pay attention not only to whether your device was made by Abbott or Bayer or Omni or Novus or Sanf uh, Sanofi, but also to consider the additional micro specifications. So if you acquired uh, an AccuCheck glucose meter, for example, um, which is made by Roche, was it an AccuCheck Aviva or an AccuCheck Nano or an AccuCheck Compact? A Compact or a Compact Plus? Missing any of these details would mean that the savings were spent on a jar of strips that wouldn't even work, um, of which I saw just dozens uh, and dozens during my field work. Some people developed other sciences of their conditions within these diagnostic gaps such as practices of tasting their urine um, to see if it was sweet. But the ubiquitous domestic presence of broken glucometers seemed to index something besides blood sugar as well. The ways people with diabetes were living with care objects that seemed to con continuously move in and out of reach, um, and the labor it took to transform these incoming devices into something besides uh, a non-system. Like blood sugar itself, the stakes could be low or high. At its most extreme, not being able to test one's glucose could lead to miscalculating a dose of insulin, for example. The comas caused by this so-called bottoming out were so common in Belize that one nurse I knew refused to prescribe insulin at all um, after seeing numerous deaths uh, that were caused this way. And she was very critical of state doctors who gave all diabetics insulin, which she saw as disregard for home situations um, where that regimen might be dangerous. Um, but there's also this huge debate around uh, sort of racialized ideas of the good patient, who's, you know, which patients um, are responsible enough to be prescribed insulin and how the glucometer, you know, played a major role in sort of mediating those negotiations. But even when a glucometer wasn't working, people still often kept their unused machines in prominent places. Um, so this is a woman named Elsie. You can see she kept her diabetes medicines and that blue plastic thing is her glucometer in this glass case. And somehow this image kind of um, stuck with me because the box contains the very technologies that if they had been maintained could have prevented um, her double amputation that was caused by her diabetes, which seems somehow outside, like it's almost like a tiny museum display or something that the, the medicines um, um, are suspended within somehow. So such devices are inevitably also, as Sherry Turkle would have it, things we think with, reflecting logics to the places where they originated, to be sure, but also inflecting the social interactions and ethical exchanges that were possible between people on the ground. They were artifacts of care and intentions over time, perhaps waiting to be replenished by a new visitor or an intervention that might return. Sometimes people are able to activate kin networks in the U.S. or have relatives in Chicago or L.A. use their Medicare cover test strips and send them by mail, 
although this strategy was just as likely to result in a new uh, glucose machine. Through these complicated networks, even very poor households might acquire one or two um, shortly afterwards unusable glucometers. These circulated in intimate economies of their own, traded between families or pawned for groceries. Or sometimes the strips might be scavenged for the slivers of precious metals that their electrodes contain, uh, which is part of what makes them so expensive. A lot of them actually are made with a thin layer of gold. So, and managing these messy assemblages of lancets, calibration fluid, and lithium batteries could be a family affair, one I was commonly called on to participate in, such as the replenishing of difficult to acquire strips through the recoding and backdating of the machine's timestamp, which might allow recently expired strips to come back into circulation. Um, this always made me really uncomfortable, um, sort of the ethical implications of this practice. But in many cases, refusing to fiddle with the machine would have meant no way to test it all. There's been a recent surge of interest in science studies around themes of repair and maintenance, galvanized in part by information scientist Stephen Jackson's writings on these topics, which are taken to frame an emerging area of media and technology studies. Yet I understand this to be an area of concern that anthropologists have been closely attending to, to for quite a while, the work of sustaining fragile systems in a context where not just infrastructures and objects, but also bodies themselves are in need of maintenance. Um, so I'm thinking here, for example, of Julie Livingston's work on improvising medicine, um, Adriana Petrina's work on the work of care, um, and uh, Joelle Beale's focus on what happens in the meantime. So as Keith Walu uh, recently raised for us, chronic diseases ask us all to think on different time scales. In her writing on the logic of care, Anthropologist and philosopher Anne-Marie Moll describes what she calls such tinkering as, quote, an open-ended process. Try, adjust, try again. In dealing with a disease that's chronic, the care process is chronic too. It only ends when you die. In this sense, caring for people and caring for the technologies that might sustain them became intertwined domains of technical as well as moral work. Consider, for example, Adrian who was born without legs in northern Belize and now cobbles spare feet and limbs for people in his workshop. Um, so I should say here that uh, five out of six amputations in Belize are caused by diabetes, which people just call sweet foot when your foot starts rotting. Um, so before he began the partnership with a friend who bought used legs in a suitcase from Texas, prosthetics were available any unavailable anywhere in the country. A foreign mission team visits his workshop for one week, usually once a year to bring new technological parts. But Adrian spends most of his time doing the e intermediary work of measuring, following up, um, or resizing arms and legs as people's st stumps change over time. These little acts of maintenance themselves invent something, including the social ties that can cohere and thicken around these encounters. Dialysis is perhaps the quintessential example of a generative, the generative potential in the history of tinkering. After all, the first working dialysis machine was cobbled out of sausage casings, orange juice can cans, and a clothes washing machine during a time of rupture and war, when Dutch physician Wilhelm Kolf, tinkering with his vision of an art artificial organ, transformed the history of medicine. And not just treatment technology itself, but the idea of a right to it um, was also a front of tinkering uh, in Belize. So the expectations I encountered there proved quite different, for example, from what my colleague Shireen Hamdi has described in her, her work with dialysis uh, and transplant patients in Egypt, where people expressed an idea that, quote, both their state and the, their kidneys had failed. Charges and protests that also animated future demands and spoke of a responsibility, if a largely unfulfilled and highly contested one, that the state was widely understood to have had toward its citizens in the first place. In Belize, I struggled to understand why I never really heard anything like this in, during much of my field work. With so many diabetics dying preventable deaths and sustaining losses all around me, patients seemed to implicate themselves um, and each other and to take the limits of the state, system, and measured stride. Belize was a latecomer to independence. Um, they actually asked England to stay on as a colonial power until 1981 due to the threat of invasion from Guatemala. Um, so this shaped a national identity of a particular and vague kind, 
bringing little coherence to the divergent histories of the Creole, Maya, Mestizo, Garifuna, and Mennonite people who compromise the majority of its population. Today, Belize has become the most violent country in the Caribbean. Um, and the third most violent country in the world. So like a lot of anthropologists, I've kind of this tortured relationship to statistics where um, you know, numbers help you tell certain stories but also require certain counter stories. Um, but even as diabetes has become a leading cause of death among women, murder has remained the leading cause of death among men, a phenomenon that the Belizean newspapers have dubbed sugar and bullets. People seemed unsure what to expect from their country. Um, in terms of health or anything else. This was the broader political backdrop when I met Jose Cruz in Belize City. By that time, he had already reached a certain level of national celebrity after initiating the first rights-based patient activism movement in the history of Belizean medicine. Together with other dying patients and their families, he organized civic protests and eventually leveraged the government into participating with an American institution to build the country's first public dialysis center. Um, Belize does not have a constitutional right to health, and Cruz's actions were not played out on judicial fronts, but rather through the national media um, that covered his activism. So we talked a little bit yesterday about what protests look like. It's interesting because um, to see one of these in person was sort of very underwhelming. You know, it would be maybe like one or two dozen people in the street. But then um, through the, the way it was covered in newspapers, it was enough to fill a frame. So there was this kind of like literal reframing. Um, so um, he would also issue press releases about each part of his body that got amputated within a health system <coughs> unable to support patients like him. And for a time, he boycotted his own dialysis movement or treatment um, until the government took steps to offer the same to other patients on the waiting list. It's open for us to affect human history, he told me when we spoke in 2010. Because Cruz's work to create an idea of rights took place largely through the news stories written about him, I'm trying to take seriously the different work of narrating them myself as an anthropologist. As Clara Hahn has shown in her development of Cavell's act of awaiting to re-examine care relations, time is a key horizon. And the center of gravity shifts depending on where you start or stop the story. I could choose to end here, for example, by telling you about the people I knew who died over the years tinkering and waiting for the dream of dialysis to become a reality. Like Josie, whose daughter once called me at midnight to come over, but there was nothing either of us could really do as we stood together while her 50-year-old mother ran fr frenetically around the house sucking air but unable to breathe as her lungs shut down from the sequelae of kidney damage. Or Nelson, who was only 22 when his organs failed for the last time, after a short lifetime as a type 1 diabetic, unable to consistently access insulin. I didn't know what to say when he showed me his bloated feet and said that he was not even on the dialysis waiting list. Apparently his kidneys were so badly damaged that he was considered a poor candidate for the costly treatment. One morning in 2010, Nelson drank three glasses of water and drowned internally in the liquid, as if it were an ocean. But I could also tell you a more heartening story about what I saw when I returned to Belize in August 2014, to the same place where almost five years before, Ethan had showed me around the hospital's garage of abandoned machines. Ethan was gone by then, moved on to mission work elsewhere. Jose Cruz had died from his illness three months after I interviewed him in 2010. But there it was on the hill, a low green building and a small sign directing patients into the Jose Cruz Memorial Dialysis Unit. Um, so you can see in this image how Cruz sort of politicized his injuries. So he's holding the uh, sign um, in a ha his hand with two fingers missing. But by the time I knew him, he was also blind and um, his leg had been amputated. Um, but then, um, so the first picture is from 2010, this one's from 2014. I suppose you can't freeze frame a happy ending any more than a tragic one. Inside the unit, two visiting dialysis nurses bustled around, one from Cameroon and the other one from the Philippines. Later that week, a Ministry of Health official worried aloud to me that the American donor who had originally funded the center 
um, who Cruz was in collaboration with, had now withdrawn after three years of training and support, as had been planned, leaving the machines to the state for maintenance. <coughs> a huge percentage of the ministry's entire operating budget was being spent to keep, up the dialysis, to keep the dialysis centers running, leaving nationwide shortages in more basic technologies, such as glucometers and even insulin, which will mean more Belizeans needing dialysis in the years ahead. Government officials are now looking for investors to help them maintain the units, hoping to find a partner in China. But also there, getting dialysis in the room that morning, was an old friend of mine named Grace. We had originally met four years ago in her mother's kitchen in the south of Belize, where the family was holding an ancestral ritual for the health and protection during a time when Grace was understood to be dying from diabetes complications and could not get dialysis at all. The last time I'd seen Grace was in 2010 in the Belize City Hospital, when she just started getting one of the three sessions that she needed each week. It was a fraction of the care that she required, but it had opened a margin of survival. Sitting there in 2014 in the new unit, where Grace was now getting all three weekly sessions, these histories meant something different already. But they were also part of the repair work that had sustained her until now. I showed Grace the picture I had taken during my last visit, and she said that she wanted people to see it. The dialysis machine whirred and beat next to us the entire time we spoke, like a shrill but persistent third voice in our conversation, as it removed accreted toxins from Grace's blood. In many parts of the world, dialysis is considered a, quote, holding measure until renal transplant becomes possible. But in Belize, where no renal transplant has yet been performed in the country's history, dialysis instead became a holding measure against death. And it's here in this holding measure with Grace that I want to close here trying to co-envision how we might remain a little longer with these experiments in maintenance and care, including ethnographic ones, now unspooling still further contingencies and precarities ahead. It was somehow comforting that the medical tubes carrying her blood into the machine for cleansing looked more pliable than I had expected, less like the electrical wiring of, of a cyborg and more like an umbilical cord. Grace followed my eyes. Still alive, she smiled. The electrodes and wires threaded the air between us, awkward and alive, into its tenuous machinery. Together we watched the centrifuge wheel her blood backwards like a wildly broken clock, trying to turn back enough time for the week ahead. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for this very moving and thought-provoking presentations and uh, I will not be able to you know full disclaimer to you know to, to attend to its you know to the complexity that you presented with with any you know substantial comment so so I will just think on the go with what I heard and with what I was moved by and I with uh, with Simone, it was so interesting the way uh, you presented evidence base. Many of us think of evidence based medicine as one of the nemesis, somehow, of how interventions tend to be framed and bypassing the social, so to speak, in the name of a technocratic mm -hmm. solution and an easily measurable intervention. And in your case, it's so interesting how you are reinventing the evidence base here as kind of introducing you know, the error, the mistake, the failure, the violence, almost like evidence of how technology and institutions you know, have come together in some ways to inflict harm. You know? So it's very interesting what you're doing with the work on, on, on evidence, almost like a, it's like a counter movement or peopling evidence-based interventions in a, in, a, in a very fascinating way. And, and there is this incredible uh, coexistence, contradiction, or paradox in, in the subjects that you present, right? So, so, you have, um, uh, so you have those, the consumer subjects, you have the political 
subjects, right? And I think that that big party, you know, where the C-section is a big party with, you know, mm -hmm. where the whole family is invited, it's planned. It's like, it's it, it, it's a fantastic. It's almost like a it's um it's really entertainment, capitalism, you know, and medicine come together, <laughs> in a in a, and, and that reminded me also of the work of plastic surgery in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So. You know, the, so the broader fetishization and assimilation, you know, of a, of a health technology, and and the currency and the value this has. You know. So 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 it would be interesting to explore a little bit more where this falling for the technology gains uh, started to gain so much traction, you know, and what it stands for. Does it stand for social mobility? Does it stand for, you know, access to something from the state? Does it stand for, you know, the outside world, the first world, so to speak? And I, but, but, but I think it's fascinating to explore where does that, you know, come from, this falling so deeply and so profoundly for technology, and uh, that manifests itself, you know, as we heard in the previous sections, you know, this, and in, in um, this is really this this medicalization or pharmaceuticalization of, of any imagination of, 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 of intervention from birth to death you know? and I and I think the, the question that you raised about the, the scientific and health literacy is so fascinating because it really is a question of saying where where is any form of accountability of, uh, of the risk that has been inflicted of the harm that was done. And, and when you have this diffused therapeutic medical market blend into services, into medical uh, legitimacy of practice, and into patient desire, it's so striking, you know, so where is the regulation? So where is the state here? Right, so so we really see the market everywhere, in all fields and among all players, and I think this um, this this fascinating form of social mobilization is up in terms of disinvestment of technology. You know, it's 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 a fascinating move, and I wonder how that coexists with which kind of politics that might be possible at a broader level, right, at a federal level. I would imagine. You know, health technology assessment, but also legislation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, not to mention mechanisms of, of broader accountability. And uh, and and I think the last point is very interesting. We didn't speak about this uh, today or in those terms, but it has been implicit. This uh, uh, this role of the media, this role of education, mm -hmm. right? Literacy, as you said, scientific health literacy, and um, and how people mobilize through which means. And Charles Briggs and Clara Martinez Briggs, his, uh, uh, his wife, you know, there at UC Berkeley, they have been talking about um, health, communication health rights. Mm -hmm. so, so, so can we think about, it goes on very much along the lines of what you were saying about the consent, information, you know, and, I, and, and in some ways also then who speaks, who produces the evidence, mm -hmm. but what's actually available, you know, and I, and I think this question of communication or uh, the right to know and to know your rights. I think it's a fascinating uh, domain. Uh, Amy, you know, it's it's, it's 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 always very moving, you know, to think with you and uh, with the materials that you presented and uh, like those debris, you know, and what people end up doing with those things and and the kind of the liveliness that emerges out of them. So it's it's, it's fantastic to see that as a social health force as well. So there's not a, it's not such an easy teleology of just, you know, just the dump side, it's there, we all know that story, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a very interesting, like this, the, the, the technological and the social tinkering, you know, ends up having kind of a life force of sorts, you know, a liveliness to it, which is, a, which is which really very, very fascinating and wonderful to hear. And I think there's, uh, and it would be nice for, for you to share a little bit more with us, you know, because you have this this wonderful idea of, you know, so you, you have the fragmentation of care, you have the technology, how it's dumped there, how it's recycled, 
And you have this idea also, this floating laboratory, right? So you have these technologies migrating, but there, there are so many things that go with them. So, you know, like, and, 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 and you did this beautiful work with the Rockefeller archives, you know, so, 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 so how over time we end up, uh, so we can understand the, the improvisation, but also the experimentality of medicine. And I think with this project, you're showing a little bit more some of the undercurrents or, or counter movements that are built into that floating laboratory and how people are producing, engineering yeah. these life technologies of sort, you know, and how they can be, how they can be assimilated in, in what's actually possible in that world as something against the, the deadly temporality, you know, of imminent death in the absence of, of best possible uh, care and technology. So how to sustain these fragile, fragile systems. And I think what you introduce is here like in a, in a powerful conceptual, philosophical, but also like human ways to question temporality, the multiple temporalities that, that people experiment, experience as they navigate multiple systems, right? And, and I think it's so, and I think that's an interesting thing, conversations we're having with some of our students in the seminar we're having now. You know, how do you, how do you think of agency in, when you belong to so many distinct histories, uh, systems, you know, you know, you know, biological systems, but also s commodity systems, uh, and, uh, and, and the very national absence of a system of care in Belize. So, so I think this question of, of the agency in this multiple belonging there and, uh, and attending to this question of multiple temporalities, I think it's a, it's a fascinating one. And I think this raises then the question, how do we think about you know, the agency of this patient, consumer? And, and maybe what you're saying is that maybe we only understand and you love thinking in those terms, and so I bring that up, is this having a home visit, really working with people in their homes and over time, if one can get a little bit of a sense of how this is not just poetics, but it's really a concrete dimension of an experimental vitality that the subjects embody amidst these multiple systems, floating laboratories, exclusions, precarious of all kinds, and I'm not trying to make, you know, a, you know, to, to idealize that force, but not to attend to it is also miss an opportunity, you know, to actually think of care in very uh, concrete ways that matter to people given the limits that are imposed to them. So thank you so much. Yes, uh, uh, I'm gonna add some more, few questions to it. You are uh, <laughs> the chief here is <laughs> the time and the you know what my family <laughs> have to do to deal with it every day all the time. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the, the wonderful uh, talks and, as uh, John said, very moving in, in different senses. And uh, some of the questions uh, that. Uh, that have have uh, have uh, my attention here. Chuang has already uh, touched in, but I, I'd like to 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 reinforce the, the importance of of the, the work that Simone has been playing in Brazil in terms of of showing the, the importance of uh, the the evidence the, the, the medicine based evidence based medicine. In terms of uh, this, this uh, thing that uh, John was, was telling about that is a because uh, frequent, frequently uh, the, the evidence-based medicine is is seen as something that um, gives more importance to to technological projects to to sometimes the dehumanization because of this question we were discussing in the morning that how difficult it is to produce evidence of some things that is uh, very closely linked to the, 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 the ideals of humanization. And you show how uh, the evidence can be uh, used uh, in favor of humanization. This is, this is great. And, uh, but one thing that I, I would like to, to hear you more 
is uh, how this, this um, the impact of this, for instance, in terms of the what you you, you said the the choice, the, the, the freedom of choice of mm -hmm. what way to, to, to have the delivery the, the, the childbirth. Uh, if the, the, the evidence created uh, using it in this sense is not uh, condemned to be uh, a kind of uh, one more subside to a, a, an individual uh, choice, and so what what we have to do with this evidence is just to, to inform people. Mm -hmm. And if it's not in, in, in contradiction with the need to, to have more structural uh, measures, when we, we are thinking in terms of public health and, in an assessment, global health. Uh, how can, how in your experience <laughs> are being or not uh, the, these evidences being used to, to uh, create policies for more structural uh, investments in terms of uh, financing, mm -hmm. of, of equipping the, the, the services, to to make more 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 safe uh, mm -hmm. childbirth not to the obstetricians but to the, <laughs> the women and their, their child. Uh, and another question is that how you you are thinking this this limitations that the 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 production accumulation and circulation and evidence uh, encounter because we know that uh, some some kinds of things are not uh, very easily expressed in terms of um, variables that you can count. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that some evidence that are produced in certain parts of the world, in certain uh, academic settings, does not have uh, space in the, the more important uh, academic journals to be published. Mm -hmm. And how, how uh, 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 the, the movement uh, of, of for the, the humanization of the childbirth it deals with it. And uh, Amy, uh, I, 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 I felt hearing you uh, uh, very close to what I felt when Clara uh, exposed yesterday, when uh, we, we see very clearly uh, when we, we heard uh, an ethnographic work how kind of ingenuous <laughs> is our perception of, of, of health needs when it, we are in health services, in the consultant room, uh, how much complex is to, to deal with something that's very trivial in our day-to-day -day practice as uh, primary health care physicians like their babies. Especially in a, in a, in a, in a context, as you show, that uh, at least where uh, health is not considered a right. And that's the, the, the main point of my, my question for you. Is, uh, how, how do this, this movement you, you showed us uh, deals with the fact that they are asking for something that is not recognized as a right? And what moves them? What kind of, of, of hope they have if it's not uh, uh, in, in some way, even when not uh, assured, but at least uh, in the horizon of a right for, for these people. And how you see the, in, in Belize specifically, uh, that uh, contradiction we have been discussing a lot in terms of global health, that is the, the, the action of the humanitarian uh, institutions, groups, and NGOs, uh, that sometimes uh, establish some kind of donation of, of, of temporary services, create something, and then they are not structured to maintain it. And how, how in Belize is the situation of uh, the action of humanitarian action and the, the, the lack of a state structure that can uh, give support for, for a long time. And congratulations for your, your work. Great. Excellent. So while I start to collect the questions, you guys each has one minute for an initial, an, in, an initial, an initial response. Okay. 
because you provoked us a lot, we need to get the questions. So just an initial response. Okay, I'll start. I, we believe that uh, the glamorization of C-sections is very much gender, related to gender patterns in Brazil, especially the idea of childbirth being something humiliating, degrading, uh, primitive, disgusting, and uh, so transforming this in something like that party, something that sounds very uh, attractive, because in the medical training, people uh, are, are used to uh, associate vagina birth with being poor, with being, you know, um, destitute. So th this is one of the, the, the this helps explain what the, the appeal of C-section, C-section for the poor. Sorry, vagina births for the poor. It's something they are seen primitive and so on. So this, this gender and class dimensions also are very much articulated. My, my first name. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the question of um, these sort of layered time scales and trying to uh, capture something of the ways they're interrupting each other um, is, I think, a key one here because the, these trips, especially when they're like one week mission trips, I somehow sort of stage the chronic as the acute um, for the participants who are bringing these technologies or somehow um, there's a different um, imagination of what has been accomplished, I think. Um, that it does have an experimentality but is also at the same time foreclosing other time scales such as a conversation about what's the history or what's the causality that has caused this diabetes in the first place. So um, there's um, these different, and then the home visit, you know, is um, an interesting figure with the glucometers um, because it seemed important, important to people to have their um, blood sugar m measured even when some way of remediating whatever results they um, found was um, not possible. So the, the exchange, um, was something that had a, a temporality of its own, too. Um, and the, it's interesting to think of the state as not necessarily the non-fragmentary, also. Um, so uh, Adrian's project, Hope, for example, he had sort of uh, resisted the opportunity to affiliate with the state because he was worried that whatever party was in government at the time, that then when the next party came in, his um, you know, program would become more fragile. And so he, um, for him, sustainability meant remaining a non-state um, entity. And, um, and you saw that with other programs too, like uh, World Vision would often, um, so they're supposed to be uh, just doing these eye surgeries, but people's diabetes were getting diagnosed because they were um, already blind and so, um, so it's not clear when World Vision's coming, you know, um, for one week and the state's there all the time, but somehow the, um, the, the shorter intervention is revealing something about um, the, the temporality of the state that's not necessarily mm -hmm. stable. Okay, uh, I'll try to be quickly, but uh, first I really like to uh, thank Dr. Ruiz for being here because it was great days and I learn a lot. Uh, so thank you. And uh, you're welcome. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for Amy, uh, I know that's not your subject for the lecture, but uh, you started a presentation with a wheelchair. And uh, as an, I'm an occupational therapist, mm -hmm. and one of my fields of work and teaching in Brazil and also in Portugal is about to uh, teach how to make assistive technology <coughs> with uh, low-cost products, with Home Depot. It's my treasure hunting, you know? Uh, it may be, uh, what, I can, what I'd like to bring to table and you really talk about more, it's uh, how about the creativ creativity, is that the word? How people can be creative on the, you know, uh, difficult situations or something we like we talked about it about pain uh, and uh, I'd like to ask for uh, Simone uh, how uh, in a clinical encounter did you 
uh, find something or uh, think something about the conflict, uh, information and autonomy and technical decisions. You know, sometimes uh, it's not about uh, my choice as a woman, but uh, a medical choice, a technical choice. And the last one, uh, and I'd like to thank also Professor Clara because uh, your lecture came uh, again and again and again. I work in palliative care, and in every single session of yesterday and today, death come to table. Uh, everybody talks about the, the war death or something about grief and death. And um, I'm connecting this with something that you said. Is it possible to teach compassion and kindness? And I would like you to, to talk about more the formation, uh, the teaching and the education of uh, professional health care, about all that has also, but um, how we have to deal with our own pain to be able to care about others. Yes, oh great, beautiful. Oh, but you were the only one who were allowed a comment and three questions from yeah. now on. So you, you got all the other quotas. So, so it's all reduced now. One question, the one that you really want to ask, okay, everyone, okay? So that we can get more people in the conversation. Okay, Italia. Um, of social ties that arise around this uh, tinkering that you were talking about and I was really struck by your example of Adrian who with this sort of prosthetics enterprise I guess you could call it and him as sort of an artisan but also a kind of doctor and also a kind of inventor and what kinds of relationships he has with the people that come to his uh, enterprise and how that might allow us to kind of reimagine the care relationship outside of the relationship of doctor and patient. Okay, so we have Peter and Rafi. No, we'll, 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 we'll go back and forth. And I do. Yes, yes, great. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, this is also a question uh, for her thoughts for Amy, although maybe it also resonates more broadly. I'm wondering how much, because you started with Vonnegut talking about the problem of maintenance more generally. We're sitting in a university where I'm sure the fundraisers would have difficulty raising money for maintenance as opposed to building, or opposed to establishing a new center or something like that. So more broadly, to what extent is this also an issue of representation, desire, and imagination of what action is, of what medicine is, of what a heroic kind of engagement of the world as a kind of salvation project would be? And also, how does it tie to the gift? Can you have an unglamorous gift? And then how do you convince people they should be giving unglamorous gifts? So Rafi, and then you guys will respond briefly, and then we'll get another Rafi. Okay, great. Um, yeah, this is also for Amy. Um, so so you know, your, your ethnographic focus was very much on a local level, and on these sort of like local economy, <coughs> care, and tinkering. Uh, and uh, you know, while we don't want to sort of go back to that joke of saying that this village is a dumping ground. It's so clearly entangled in these kind of more sinister global processes. Um, even the you know donated medical equipment is often easier to donate and less costly for hospitals than it is for them to dispose of here. And then kind of going on to uh, you know the, the economic you know where, where do pharmaceutical companies fit into this with these older models and sort of creating a new market for it. Um, you know, even the idea of diabetes emerging as a new disease is, a very, you know, that's a product of food economics, and, and then you kind of, you end with the fact that the, the clinic is staffed with Africans and Filipinos, and so it's sort of like, it's this nexus of all these sort of strange global processes, but the, the expression and the activism is very local, sort of, and, um, so, so I was kind of wondering, is there, is there any, you know, how is it discussed that they, this, there's this converging of all these inter-meta processes, and, and then also where does the Ministry of Health fit into to its own form of activism at a broader audience? Um, yeah. So about choice. Uh, as a radical feminist, I, I believe in choice. No, yes. you of <laughs> all uh, people. <laughs> I, I believe in women's ability to, capacity to decide ethically about this, you know? The, the point is, and this is a, this is a very important, I'm, I'm a total minority in my, my opinion with that, 
idea since I, I, there was a study. You are the Deleuzean subject par excellence here. <laughs> There's a oh, no, minority. Yeah, the, uh, in, the, in the movement and the, for people who deal with public policies because people think, you know, uh, it is interesting because it's a research in Brazil. They ask doctors from the, uh, that is public, women in public sector, and they ask them, uh, who should decide? In the public sector, they say, of course, it's the doctor based on clinical consideration about safety and effectiveness, etc. And w what about in the private? Oh, in the private sector, women are dif differentiadas, so they are they have more education, etc. So they are yes. <laughs> So they have more education. So this is a kind of moral degree that's you know higher. That so these women were would, would be entitled to decide. This, this is, uh, uh, we are being debated for years about having a, a clinical trial about C-section. Hmm. What, what I'm saying is because people say it's not ethically acceptable because we all know that C-section impl implies more risk for both mother and baby. And I say, in a context that you have 80, 90% in the, in the private sector, C-section, <coughs> if you randomize, you reduce immediately to half, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because you have, the two arms, and so on. We have to test the imagination for this. Mm -hmm. I think that we only can think about choice if we have informed choice. And what people have is very biased choice. Mm -hmm. So people would say, can you conceive that a woman that knows all epigenetics and the microbiology and the, the different prognosis, etc., the risk of the baby, she would choose uh, 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 a C-section? Well, this is a much more complex issue. What's the reason why people are so phobic of childbirth. In this culture, you know, in our, uh, uh, in Brazil, especially where we have this history of so much violence in childbirth care. So uh, we have to, to pay the price of all this uh, violence for all this, this time. So this is a very complex issue. Uh, but uh, I tend to think that women should be entitled to decide. So, so uh, when you said about, um, uh, how to use evidence, and, and uh, I, I tell my students, I teach this, so I tell my students, if we don't produce the evidence that interests us, nobody will, <laughs> you know, and this is the reason why you have to understand the method. I tell my students, you have to be the dominant tricks of the method, then I understand, <laughs> what, you know, and I tell them, when I teach them about systematic review, I show the systematic review of companionship, it's the perfect one, hardnet, uh, Ellen Hodden is the first author. It's being reviewed. Why? Because they started with a qualitative study in Canada. And uh, what was the, the thing that women hated most was to be alone. It was loneliness. They used to meet 16 pers people, different people that they never met before, and be alone for most of labor. So they hated this. This was the top. And they, when they presented this evidence, they said, oh, this is not clinically relevant evidence. So what they did, they made the first randomized control trial of soft technology for companionship, just to have someone with them. They made the first, the second, the third, they, they built an international collaboration to, be, to, be, to have randomized control trial for companionship in childhood. <coughs> and it became the universal panacea because it, it improves all possible health indicator during childbirth, from baby's apigar to risk of infection. So it became almost mandatory for everybody. So people, it's a whole social movement to subvert the logic of what is, um, what is uh, scientific uh, legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So this is, we, we have to uh, make this kind of subversion because based on this, since the 90s, we are having laws in Brazil to enforce the right of companionship. And up to now, you know, we, we, we can't in, in enforce this totally. There's a lot of resistance and so on. So the, I, I, we need to, to open our imagination to new forms to deal with this. Um, if it's possible to teach kindness, uh, this, uh, I suggest the reading of Cochrane in his debate about this, because he says it's very important to teach sociology, anthropology, and, and psychology, and so on. But uh, compassion and kindness is, 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 is taught by the example, you know? Mm. And uh, how can we provide the example, if, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in private? I, I was telling people about 
this, this issues in, in the HU, the, the ho university hospital, people got into episiotomies for people to train the, the surgical skills. What kind of value are we teaching? So uh, the, the values are, are taught by the, the role models. So how can we uh, have this? In UK, they try to train for compassion. It's very it's an interesting experience. It's uh, worth knowing more about this. And uh, the other thing is about indicators of change, you know. Uh, in, social, uh, uh, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, we have a very dense, popular health movement. And they always say, they, they, they have one indicator for, uh, let's say, humanization, let's say. Look to look in the eye. If the doctor look at you in the eye, so there are some 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 possible indicators of how people feel that the other one related. There's a so uh, a clinical encounter that people will feel recognized and so on. So it needs a lot of imagination. There are people doing this, and they have indicators related to time. The issue of physical contact is something that's very much important clinically and also in relational terms. So. Uh, can we think about open our imagination? This is very contextual. What is what is true here may not be in other settings and so on. That's great. Amy, a minute and a half. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, these are really great questions. So I, I might not be able. I can't answer them all in a minute and a half. So I hope some of us get to talk afterwards. But um, I, I love this um, figure of the artisan slash doctor slash inventor. So I wanted to start there. Um, because I think for, um, at least in her piece on tinkering, which I think is really beautiful, uh, Anne-Marie Moll is more uh, focusing on the tinkering that happens between doctors and patients. Um, but I think um, things I find interesting here are, um, in the absence of a doctor, how did, who are the actors who are engaged in that tinkering? So, or sometimes it's maybe between patients and objects, for example. Um, and um, so it's interesting by the time that, um, Jose Cruz sort of uh, reached this national celebrity. People started doc calling him Dr. Cruz, which was interesting because there's not, at, at that time, there wasn't a nephrologist in the entire country of Belize. He had died in a car accident. There wasn't another one. So it was sort of, um, you know, in this absence of another doctor, um, you know, that, that kind of tinkering, I think, maybe takes on um, a heavier charge. And um, so the, the creative force of that. Um, I think the challenge is to try to capture it without romanticizing it, where I, I feel like this constant tension between um, trying to capture what is lively, um, but also to keep somehow in frame the weight of death. So that goes back to another one of the questions. And um, you know, the, the specter of um, like what's really at stake in these um, things that can seem like almost games, you know, and um, so, um, and that kind of ties into Rafi's question about these sinister meta processes. And um, I think can be part of what is um, uh, taken to be out of frame when diabetes education is given that it just has to do with, um, so, you know, you're the patient and this is what you need to eat now, as if there wasn't an entire political economy shaping um, what's nutritionally available and that kind of thing. So it's you asked what is the Ministry of Health doing um, and what maybe could they do. Um, one of the really, um, to me, crucial areas um, in diabetes and maybe what might come next is um, talking between ministries. So if you're thinking about something like the food that's grown in a country like Belize, which is extremely constrained and mostly for export, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, has to be part of that conversation, not just the Ministry of Health. So there are these conversations now around diabetes care and can doctors prescribe seeds? Um, so, you know, trying to um, think outside the, the usual frames is um, a, a difficult thing, but um, for me, that I see a possible vitality there. Um, yeah, um, so that <laughs> that made me think back to the, the question of experimentality um, that Joao raised earlier, and I didn't really answer. Um, so, but it's the first time you didn't answer, and it's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, because there is very much an experimentality, obvious um, in these sort of short trips, but um, 
to think of the kind of evidence that's being collected and by who, I guess, is part of the question. And so, um, so the idea of gifts and when is a gift unglamorous, you know, with, without waiting to see what happens when the gift turns into poison, you know, to go back to Marcel Mose. Like, for example, um, if a patient is given metformin, but they're already um, ha experiencing organ failure and no one's done testing to look for that, then the metformin can actually make someone with diabetes go into kidney damage, such as the kind of required. So the same medicines that are supposed to prevent the need for dialysis can cause it if there's not these other frames. But who's going to know that if you just give someone the metformin and leave? You know, and so um, I, I guess I try to take an ethnographic entry point there of. Um, thinking of the kinds of evidence I'm collecting in relation to, but um, different than the kinds of evidence that people on these trips are collecting. So we'll get one more round. We had Clara, we had uh, Cesar. We, we, wait, we'll go in order here. We had Sophia. I'll back up. back up. <laughs> okay, we had Gabriela, we had Gita, and then, and then on the back, Mizi and Moises. Okay, we'll please succinct to the point, it is possible. Yeah. Oh, yes, I forgot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can I actually address both people? So I'm just going to fail No, no, here. not one. <laughs> no, I'm still going to address both. So the point is, is that <laughs> No, no, actually, come on. No, we need to be at 610, very, okay? Just one citation that actually the, the, there would be a very interesting book to look at of uh, Samina Mullah's The Violence of Care that looks at mm -hmm. uh, uh, forensic nurses and rape assault uh, and actually the very institutions of care actually mm -hmm. are creating care it's, uh, the violence itself. But for Amy, um, the point is, like, what I was actually thinking was very interesting was to actually challenge the idea and the utility of the idea of system. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, because what I saw in the ethnography wasn't a system per se, but really was the question of how does how does one think through or think disease in the community that is actually quite different than disease in the clinic. Um, and how would one think that in terms of, for example, a network of actions that wouldn't be like a Latorian network that gets more real as you kind of accumulate um, connections, but rather is, is constantly fragile. So if we were to actually think of disease in the community, uh, would we necessarily always fall back on the language of the patient? Um, and so what I found striking was in your ethnography, but, but it is there, is that it's not necessarily only that the patient, the, you know, it's not the language of the patient, but there could be, for example, you know, if we think disease in the community, isn't there also a language of kinship, of, you know, the neighbor? Of, so in what ways does disease in the community actually look different and present different concepts? How would we actually have to, you know, actually literally shift our frame uh, of differently such that the illness is not an illness narrative of a patient, right, with a plot, but rather like the actual world in which disease itself grows. Mm -hmm. So I think that that it may be a very, it, might, it just might be helpful to think through that a little bit. Great. So thank you. Yeah, I wanted to hear a little bit more about this issue of agency and, and political subjectivity, kind of the movement that people have in these in this regards. And I was thinking uh, more with, um, like Agnes Keller from the Budapest School is philosopher that thinks about, you know, it, where choosing is really an option to, to think about, or, or when, when, when you, you can think about choosing, you have options to choose, right? And I, and I was thinking how in these cases they also reflect an idea of people knowing that you are being set up for something hurtful, uh, but you have to know what's coming up in both cases to kind of reach that mobility in that. Uh, that kind of agency to give the fight. But I was also thinking how, uh, for example, in the in the case of C-sections and stuff, um, th there is also a, a sense of a bourgeois, I think, of the positive in the people or the idea of choosing for the best care, when there are moments in which you, you have to transmit your care for someone else to care for you, right? Mm -hmm. So when it's not viable for you anymore, the baby, then you have to trust that. It's so so it, it just, um, how, how to think about this issue? So, the subjective experience of, of acting on the world, but also community action, um, you know, to provide the best care. When, for example, in your case, how does political subjectivity stop when you don't have a, a you know, a kidney transplant unit, and then you know, people still fight, and you leave us with that idea and that image that 
we're not there yet, and this woman is just waiting and transitioning periodically you know, towards something that she shouldn't be having to face. So I, I wonder if there is also a pair out, you know, what, what moves us and what moves people that connect care with politics. That's great. All those questions are, t you know, uh, they are tying several, no, they're wonderful. They are really tying up like the broader questions that emerge. It's really, it's fantastic. You know, yes? And what I wanted to ask you, Simone. A little bit louder. Simone, I wanted to ask you, uh, if more than teaching compassion and care, we could try to teach people how to promote and negotiate with patients, uh, the, how to achieve their choices. I think that would be maybe a, a way to try to also teach it and not only learn from values and practice. So if you have any example or suggestion on that. And also regarding indicators for making evaluations, if you can also uh, more than only, I'm sorry, more than only uh, center, centering patients, also focus uh, on um, how to see if the process, the work, working process can try to guide us to choices and that's it. Okay. No, <laughs> Kita, uh, just a short question. Mm -hmm. Simone, are you like to know uh, if uh, uh, the obstetric violence is a crime in the legal point mm -hmm. of view? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the legal evidence if, if it's mm -hmm. a crime. Okay. So one, <laughs> one more. Uh, you're talking about the Compassion, teaching compassion and care. Can you link it with the social markers of the difference? Because sometimes mm -hmm. it makes a lot of mm -hmm. difference if you work with it. Great. My question for Simone. Simone, you were talking about use and abuse of technology on delivery, on childbirth. Yes. And you provoke us when you ask how to escape to this. Mm -hmm. And my question is what's our role as? Um, researchers in this process. I'm talking about the role of science communication, but also mm -hmm. I'd like to know about the role of the media in this process. Music? Um, yeah, Louder? Um, Please. Is also for Professor Denise. Um, in cases like childbirth, in which a traditional mechanism of care has been linked to violence and disrespect, um, how can people who are believed to be the problem, like the providers, sort of fix that trust deficit and reintroduce the legitimacy of a procedure like vaginal delivery when in the past they were the same people who also perceived to be selling um, C sections? Great. Yes. What is that? Uh, well, my, my, my question is uh, actually a little bit from the, the main uh, question, so it doesn't need to be answered in the first place. Uh, but it's, it's more like curious, uh, curiosity about um, the way you actually organize your presentation in terms of how you play with the images. So my question is uh, how you can actually think about connecting uh, technology, humanness, you know, how this play actually reflect, reflects on the use uh, of the images themselves in the sense of which kind of alternative stories they allow you to tell, uh, which kind of different languages they, 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 they permit to think about. We got them all, yeah. <laughs> okay, now you guys have 15 seconds each. <laughs> <laughs> About the alternative stories and new narratives. I don't know if it was for me or for, uh, <laughs> or for her, but anyway, uh, there's a, a boom of uh, websites now about new images of childbirth. It's amazing. And there's a, there's a, a whole <coughs> group of people, a whole network research about narratives. It's very interesting because it's, uh, it, this is very subversive. And I think that uh, this is one of the most uh, uh, promising uh, ways to go. So lots of film documentaries, uh, art exhibits, and so on. So much things being done to, to this because to, uh, to, fail, to, to challenge the imaginary that we have, I think that art is a great possibility. About the trust deficit, it's, uh, it's, it's something that has to be rebuilt totally. So there are, I think that the new providers are helping this, and even the, the let's say, the dissidents <coughs> in the, the medical practice are doing a lot to, to, to build new forms of communication and uh, they use some instruments like building birth plans and uh, uh, rethinking the idea of uh, 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 antenatal education and so on. So I think there are new possibilities being thought. 
uh, and the media has a very important role on this. And I'm very glad to say that uh, uh, the last couple of years, uh, there was a lot of uh, awards for uh, very good matters on uh, obstetric violence, obstetric situation, and people used to say, if you talk about uh, obstetric violence, you're gonna get an award, because, so media is doing a very good uh, uh, self-criticism, because it's been playing a very uh, horrible role recently. Uh, I, I, I think that teaching formal choice could be extremely interesting in having uh, we have to teach this, you know, because this would be revolutionary because we are very prescriptive and we understand that some situations uh, can have choices but I do not. And uh, I completely agree with you. We have some people that we believe they're able to choose and the other that we have to, to choose for them. It, it, this is very clear. All research uh, are showing this. And I think that this is a way to go. Uh, the, the studies on companionship that we just published are very much show this. This is this key. Um, if it's a crime, obstetric violence. It, it, in Brazil, it's not typified as crime. In other countries, Latin America already is. Mm -hmm. But people are finding legal uh, possibilities for this, especially, you know, uh, it started uh, people uh, treating like a battery, you know, physical assault because it's non-consented. So there are lots, a lot of uh, uh, new formulation about uh, like physical assault for episiotomy and so on. So this is very, this is a lot of work being done on this. Just to say the issue, I think that regulation is key, you know, because we have this, this our health ministry has not been regulating what, what it should. Uh, so this, the idea of medical autonomy that goes over patients' rights to information and to, to consent and so on is part of our culture. If we don't change this culture through regulation, you know, into information and so on, nothing will happen. This public audience are all about regulation, on how to regulate practice. This is the reason why we have to challenge the idea of medical autonomy, that doctors are entitled to do whatever they want. And in Brazil, we have a situation we have cities with 100% of C-sections, because there's no regulation. 100%. In Sao Paulo, there are 13 cities with 100% of C-sections. Well, it's amazing how people are able 100% in the city, yeah. Uh, so what social movements are saying is, is this, instead of abusing of birthing women, we should pamper them, treat them well, and so on, and build the, the, the conditions for this, so that's hope. And uh, this is one of the, one of the, why people are saying this also, uh, in, in Portuguese we say, Chega de parto violento para vender cesáreas. Stop violent birth to sell C-section. And because now there's a whole movement, it's not only in Brazil, it's uh, uh, everywhere. They, they call themselves the refugees of the system. People just get out of the hospital. They, they decide to sometimes to, to, to deliver, uh, to have babies without a cease and so on. And people say that, the, the movement say that these people should not be treated as delinquent as they are being treated, but as the canary in the coal, coal mine. You know, they are the, 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 the symbol of how, how dangerous the system is. So they're, they're calling the <laughs> themselves political refugees for you to, to, to know how, they, how, how strongly they politicize the violence of care. And Clara, thank you for the suggestion for breathing. I'll get more information about this. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so Clara, maybe we can talk afterwards because yeah. I think there's a lot there. But um, one sort of interesting attempt to try to um, track diabetes out on the community level. Um, I'm forgetting his name right now, but there's um, a Brazilian scholar who um, made these these images of trees that were tracking everyone's care exchanges. Um, so um, and who it was with, and you know, and so trying to visualize um, those sort of micro encounters is, I think, an interesting area, but whether that is a system or not is, I think, a really important question. You know? um, so, and then this question of what moves people um, to en end with by uh, circling back to Jose Ricardo's question about, um, you know, how do you ask for a right that doesn't exist? Um, so, 
to think ethnographically. Um, the uh, Belizean Ministry of Health, their logo is equal health for all. Um, but so Jose Cruz approached this by saying that they were treating some people more equally than others. Um, so that's you know reference to George Orwell's Animal Farm that all the animals are equal, <laughs> but um, some of the animals are more equal than others, um, which I thought was just an interesting figure of thought that he kind of introduced um, because Orwell said he wrote that book when he saw this uh, horse being whipped whenever it wanted to turn um, by this little boy, and he thought that um, to himself that if animals realized their own strength, we would have no power over them. Um, and that the poor are um, move in relation to those in power in the same way. So, so that was Orwell's figure of thought. But the way Jose Cruz evoked it, I think, is an interesting one because for me, it's not like a false consciousness argument, but a question of knowing. Um, you know, how how do we build um, a body of evidence so that people can know about um, you know these larger situations. And so the, the question of images, um, I think, is part of that, both in how they're being used, for example, in the Belizean media, but also how I'm trying to use them differently. But um, I, don't, I, I think sometimes of Ariel Zule's idea that photography can be a civil contract, that the idea that the image could make a demand um, on a viewer that's outside a state system, for example, um, in which those concerns couldn't be um, redressed otherwise. So, you know, trying to think of images as making demands on the people like you who see them is um, part of what I'm trying to do. Wow. This has been an incredible journey since yesterday. I really want to thank all the presenters, discussants. I thank you all for, you know, for coming from near and from afar and for engaging so deeply. And uh, special thanks to our final uh, presenters here for leaving us with so much, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.